The whole point of having the animals is to teach people about conservation. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome to a very exciting episode of the Rasafari Podcast. Now, if you're caught up, then you know that this week's episode is a sequel of sorts to last week's episode, although you didn't actually have to listen to last week's episode for this one to make sense. So for last week's episode, I had on Emily Mack, a hoofstock keeper at Zoo Knoxville. And for those of you who have been listening for a while, you know that on multiple occasions, we have been graced by the presence of Tiffany James, who is another keeper at Zoo Knoxville and has become a very good friend of the pod. She has shared, well, let's be honest, she's probably shared way too much on this podcast. And um, we've become buds and it's it's all very cool and exciting. So uh, yeah. And um, they went to Africa together to do some in situ conservation work. And then they came on the Ross Safari podcast to share about it with all of you. Uh, I love this so much. Um, you'll hear about how they got to go on this trip, what they did on the trip, all that good stuff. You're also going to hear about honey badgers. Now, honey badgers have appeared on the podcast before. I actually got to meet some in Naples, and it was incredible. But um, I had an experience not too long ago that have shot honey badgers up my list of, of beloved animals. I almost said favorite animals, but I, 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 could, I could feel some of you waiting for it to make fun of me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say beloved animals. Um, and they are just, they're really cool. And there's some really, really good stories about one particular honey badger in this episode that I cannot wait to share with all of you. Now, I need to tell you real quick that um, there is also about seven minutes of bonus audio that uh, only my patrons get to listen to. So I try to do this uh, frequently. It doesn't quite happen every episode, but I frequently get bonus footage that goes exclusively to my patrons. So if you are interested in being a part of that team for as little as $3 a month, you can go to patreon.com slash Safari, become a patron, and hear this awesome bonus footage. In this case, we talk about what life is like living in Africa when you're doing the kind of thing they're doing. And um, there's also a really adorable story about a bush baby and some other cool stuff. So uh, yeah, it's it's a really good one. We have a lot of fun with this one. All right, but getting back to the main episode at hand right now. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of really good stuff here. We go deep into a conversation on rhino conservation. And um, I guess we present some different sides of a story. It gets it gets not at all argumentative, but really deep and really into some of the challenges facing conservation, uh, even though there are some great rhino numbers coming out of Africa right now. Um, I'm actually recording this uh, intro on World Rhino Day. And um, yeah, there's some, there's some good stuff that if you listened to last week's episode of Zoos, I'm assuming I put in there, but I haven't actually recorded recorded that one yet, but I'm, I'm assuming it's in there. Um, yeah, probably. So anyway, I know I'm a dork. Um, there was only one negative thing that I have to share about this entire episode, which is that, uh, as she did in her last episode, Emily recorded in, uh, at work, you know, at, in the barn there. And, um, this time, uh, along with me not getting to see any giraffes, um, there was a lack of headphones, uh, not the end of the world. Um, you will hear a little bit of, uh, echo occasionally when we were all talking over each other. It's not too bad. I cut out a lot of stuff that was her not talking and us just being echoey, uh, Tiffany and I. So yeah, I did most of that, but there were a few things that could not be edited. So you'll hear a little bit of that, but it's okay. And the content is so good that it is well worth any audio issues that we have. 
Oh, yeah. I also wanted to tell you that Tiffany is one of the people who encouraged me to do Project Dragonfly the most. And um, you're going to get to hear a little update on my schooling and and hear how it is already affecting the podcast on this one, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, this is a good one, y'all. So I'm going to shut the heck up and let you listen to it. So without further ado, here is my interview with Emily Mack and Tiffany James of Zoo Knoxville, all about their trip to Africa. All right, we are recording. So, hi friends. Hello. Hi. All right, let's start off by uh, saying who y'all are, reintroducing yourselves to my listeners. We'll, we'll start with Tiffany. Hi, so I'm Tiffany. <laughs> you have all heard me a couple times now because I like to talk about animals and conservation. Um, so I am in the East Mammals Department at Zoo Knoxville. Uh, so I work with all kinds of animals, including rhinos, black bears, dikers, um, otters now. So, Ooh, yeah. otters. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very cool. And uh, Emily, who are you? I guess you're Emily. I just said that. Maybe. Just maybe. Um, I'm Emily Mack, also at Zoo Knoxville, and I work with giraffe and zebra. Yes. And um, so the way we are doing this is I will put out Emily's normal episode and then this one back to back. So listeners will be familiar. Uh, if y'all haven't heard Tiffany's episodes, you should because they are wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're actually not here to talk too much about the zoo situation, but y'all decided to go to some place called, I think, Africa. And do some stuff. And so we're going to talk about that experience. But uh, let's start off by talking a little bit about how you got there. Uh, Emily, do you want to want to tell people how this was able to be funded? So we have a program at the zoo called Quarters for Conservation. And part of that is um, funding that goes toward trips or conferences or anything like that that we as keepers can apply for. Um, so Tiffany and I applied to go on a group uh, Q4C funded trip to Mahola Holo, South Africa. Ah, uh, you're just making up names now. Mahola Holo, is that what you said? Sounds like Mahola a place. Mahola Holo, yeah. Okay, sounds like a place in Hawaii. It's even more fun to try to spell it. It's like how many HOs? <laughs> <laughs> how many hoes we got in yeah, this? Right, like a lot of hoes here. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Tina, I apologize for your staff. <laughs> All right. So that's really cool. Do a lot of zoos do that kind of thing that y'all know of? No, not a lot. So it's honestly, I think my favorite thing about Zoo Knoxville um, because this isn't just for keepers, which is cool. So literally all staff members can apply. You can be part-time, seasonal, full-time. You can be a keeper. You can work in maintenance. I mean, it's, it's for everybody, which is really cool. So you can find the project that you have, apply into it. And then um, if you get awarded for the grant, like Emily and I did, your trip is fully funded, which is really cool. Um, all of the zoos I've worked at, they, they might have like one person that they'll send on a trip each year, but it's very, very competitive if they have it at all. And Zoo Knoxville's program is, I just like that it's open to everybody. So, so many people can be funded each year. And I feel like we make a bigger impact that way, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It does. That's really, really cool. Um, so did you guys like apply together or did you both just apply for the same thing? How, how does that work? Um, so you can apply for a, each individual person can apply for an individual project or it can be a conference or a class. Um, and then you can also apply and get awarded, a, potentially awarded a group one. So Tiffany and I applied uh, together and that was our group uh, funded trip. And then I did a different one as my individual one and I think Tiffany did too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the trip that I spoke about on our last um, interview with this was about my uh, PDO for this year. PDOs are what we call it for short. It's professional development opportunity. So we might say that throughout this. Yeah. Good to know. Thank you. And that's cool that it's everything from like going and doing in situ conservation work to like going to conferences because, yeah. you know, I was just at the AZA conference and it was awesome. One of the keepers there actually went through a PDO. Um, so that was his 
thing. So you could do classes online too. So if we wanted to um, do something with uh, Natural Encounters Inc. or NEI, I'm sure you've heard of Steve Martin before with training. Met him at the conference, actually. Yes. Ah! We have fun Steve Martin stories from this trip. Um, but yeah, you could you could take an online course and that would be covered too. So it's it's really open to whatever your imagination is and connecting that to uh, your role at the zoo. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like exactly what you're doing at the zoo. So I could apply to work with dolphins if I liked water, which I don't, um, even though I don't work with them. So it's just kind of relating it. It's super cool. That is super cool. Now, Emily, I'm going to interrupt for one second here. Sorry, because I, I need to pry a little bit deeper with Tiffany. Tiffany was just able to come up with an example of anything that she could think of, and she picked a project that she wouldn't want to do. Tiffany, are you okay, friend? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to <laughs> pick something that I didn't want to do because it can just show you the possibilities. Because <laughs> realistically, the first thing that came to mind was primates, of course. Of course. Um, have you met me? Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just picked something totally random. All right. <laughs> Good. I like that Emily smacked her hand on her forehead when you did that. <laughs> yeah. She does that a lot around me. That's right, fair. Emily? It's true. It's very true, actually. <laughs> but what, what were you going to say, Emily? Um, my individual PDO this year to bring in something that I actually wanted to do. <laughs> um, I went to, there is a zoo hoofstock trim course, um, put on by a farrier named Steve Boxworth. And he's had over a hundred students now come through the program and they've all been zookeepers or zoo professionals. So I've learn that and I've been able to bring it back and apply it to the giraffe and zoo. That's awesome. Very cool. So um this is this is cool and this is one of the many reasons that we like Zoo Knoxville. But uh I, I think I think we need to talk about the trip. I mean, let's do this thing. So um talk to me just from the start. What is it like getting from Knoxville to Africa? Very long flight. <laughs> It is. This one was a direct flight. So we Ooh. went down um, to Atlanta and then over to um, South Africa. So we went to Johannesburg. Um, Emily and I are conveniently neighbors, <laughs> which made it a lot easier getting there. Um, but yeah. And how long of a flight was it roughly? 15 hours. Oh, oh, okay. Did your butts hurt when you got there? My butt hurt. Would Oh, well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. That's the important part. We're we're getting to the deep important stuff here, yes. you know, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um and then do you have any downtime or is it like you get there and go? All right. We'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the Lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. So we got there the night before um, and had a terrifying walk through the airport. You have to go through like this weird little like dark alley in order to get to where the shuttle is for... Um, airports. And I've been to Africa. I've been to Nairobi a couple times um, for my other PDOs. I thought I was like super cool, like whatever. It's not going to rattle me. But I was like, Emily, we're going to get murdered. <laughs> I have been through that airport before. Um, I went to South Africa five years ago now. But even that, I didn't remember how to get where we needed to go. <laughs> um, and there are people in the airport who will pose as porters to like carry your luggage for you, but they're not actually zoo, uh, sorry, airport employees. <laughs> they don't work oh, at Zoo Knoxville. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> they also don't work with Zoo Knoxville. Um, so we were kind of like dodging people, but trying to figure out who to go to to ask for directions. So, but we figured it out. It was fine. <laughs> we did. 
Yeah, I assumed everybody in the yellow vest worked for the airport. And this one guy picked up my bag to go into the shuttle, broke the handle off, and then wanted a tip. And I was like, <laughs> I told you not to touch my bag. What are you doing? And I was, Emily's just like, just roll with it. And I was like, I am so glad you're here. <laughs> nope. Oh, yeah. so, gosh. Yeah, mm-hmm. so we got there the night before. Um, we took, We got in the shuttle to the hotel just fine. Um, and then the next morning, we were supposed to take a five-hour drive from Johannesburg to Maholaholo, but our drive fell through. So the volunteer organization that Maholaholo works with actually rebooked us onto just an hour-long flight. So we went back to the airport, and that time we knew who to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We got to meet up with um, a couple other people in this group that were going to a different conservation experience, so not to Mahalo Hollow. Um, but it was really cool because I had mutual friends with one of them because she's a vet tech in Maine, which is where I went to college. So we just knew some of the same people. It was super random in South Africa, just drinking coffee. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. All right. So what was the goal? What, why were you going to Mahalo Hollow? So Mahalo Hollow... Um is one of the major wildlife rehabilitation centers in South Africa. They take pretty much any wild animal that's been injured and might need to be rehabbed. Um, Brian Jones is the founder and the one who runs it, although he's he's been running it for like 35 years, so he's taken a bit of a step back on the day-to-day. Um, they tend to refer primates to other places. Sorry, Tiffany. We found out. Sorry, Tiffany. <laughs> Lame. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but they not only take in animals that they rehab and release, they also have long-term residents there. Um, I went, the way that it related back to my position for our PDO, um, they do a lot of raising of baby hoof stock, and I wanted to get more knowledge on that aspect. And they not only obviously raise them with their right nutrition and stuff, but they also raise them to be released again. So I wanted to learn that aspect of it. Well, that's really cool. Nice. So um, tell me about it. Like, tell me about your first day there, you know, once you actually were able to get there and such. So we basically had um, each of us were assigned with another volunteer that had been there for longer. And we're assigned like a run, just like we are at the zoo. So like Emily and I work in different um, animal care departments in the zoo. So she takes care of giraffe zebra. I do rhinos bears. So it's basically split up like that. So I didn't take care of Emily's animals and she didn't take care of mine, but we were all working together, if that makes sense. Um, So we started out doing training um, and Emily and I uh, actually roomed with one of the keepers there. Um, who we love and we have to shout out to her. <laughs> um, so she she was helping us um, kind of navigate things. So figuring out the animals. I have this weird thing. I am freaked out by rabbits. What? They just freak me out. It's partly Emily's rabbit's fault, though, because every time <laughs> I pet sit for her, she like does this demon like rabbit dog thing where she like shakes the the like fencing. I don't know. It's terrifying. Anyway, so naturally I get assigned to like you, anyway. you wait, no, wait, you yeah. worked with chimps. No, chimps are fine. <laughs> Rabbits. <laughs> where it's at. So I used to have this thing in college where I was freaked out by chickens. <laughs> they just, <laughs> you guys are mocking me. Um, we, we are. You're so. afraid of, of rabbits and used to be afraid of chickens, but have worked with chimps. Like, yeah, we're making fun of you. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know you used to be afraid of chickens. They are terrifying. <laughs> what anyway, are you little talking dinosaurs about? coming at you. So anyway, I mostly got over that fear when I had to work with chickens in Little Rock. Uh, they were on my routine. So I'm over that. But this time I worked with probably a hundred rabbits and then also the chickens. <laughs> I was like, they were side by side. I was like, this is my nightmare. Um, no, but they're really cute. And Emily helped me with that. So that was a big part of my routine was figuring out what care they needed, making sure they had hay and water um, and all the good, right, healthy snacks. And then, um, yeah, learning. I also worked with other less interesting animals. Um, Just kidding. (laughs) Servals. What else do we have? (laughs) What What is wrong with you? (laughs) You had raptors, right? Raptors, owls. 
which are raptors, but. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was a terrible description of what we did, but <laughs> back to my fear of rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, you had the cool celebrity animals, so yeah. So my run was um, there was a serval. There were white faced owls. Sorry, any bird people, if I got that name wrong. Um, and the honey badgers. Oh wait, I um, love honey badgers. Yeah, not just any honey badger. Just keep this in mind. Um. Stoffel the honey badger. Stoffel the honey badger. Who is a local celebrity. How like, so? We visited a few other um, like primate rehabs and other places. And we had multiple people ask us how Stoffel is. All over South Africa. <laughs> and if he still escapes or not. Does he still escape? No, because he's gotten older and has mellowed out. <laughs> <laughs> There's videos like. BBC has filmed things. We'll have to send you the link to share with everybody. But it's so funny because this little honey badger would like roll mud balls and hop out. And at one point he went after a lion. He got into the lion enclosure <laughs> and the lion was, I guess, hiding from him on top of a house and needed more veterinary care than the honey badger did after. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was so crazy. So the honey badgers live in, um, their enclosure is surrounded by probably like four foot high concrete walls with um, electric wire at the top that we had to hop over, which was fun for us short people. <laughs> uh, but we had to make sure not to like pile anything too close to the wall or have anything too loose like tires or anything because he knows how to pile up rocks or like a log in one of those videos um they gave him i think a rake or something just flat on the ground and he figured out how to and they don't have thumbs or <laughs> like opposable thumbs whatever they right. have long claws but they're really good at using them and he figured out how to get this rake up against the wall and then use it to climb out that's they also amazing can't jump which blew my mind because these guys are like little like just all muscle. I don't know. They're just so destructive. This cute little predator that will just kill anything. Could definitely kill people. Um, but you could have like their um, enclosure had like a little stand in it. Um, and they could be right at the edge. Yeah. Climbing structure. Words are hard. <laughs> um, but they just couldn't jump out. So like me with primates, I'm like, how the heck are they staying in there? Like they can't just like step two feet and get out. Um, but that's like, I guess, nature's way of being like, okay, you've got all these things to make you better than everything else. Let's just like slow down there, man. Like they're also no big, like uh, diggers. So they have to make sure like he can't dig out underneath. Um, also in the BBC little documentary, they had him and his girlfriend in, in a, like a chain link enclosure with a latch. They figured out how to undo the latch. Uh, there's another pair of honey badgers there that is in like a, fully enclosed chain link enclosure and we can only use certain types of carabiners to secure the door shut because they figured out how to undo other types and like slide the latch open so they're real smart uh but they that's were really awesome fun to work with. oh that's cool i love honey badgers so much so there is a honey badger uh that lives at the san diego zoo in their Africa Rocks area. Uh, her name is Benzi, and she is a freaking star. And um, yeah, there was one time that I was there and they had put some meat in a tree uh, for her, uh, for enrichment, and watching her try to get it. And like you said, they can't they can't jump um, and then get herself into that tree just by force of will and climbing and attacking it. And it was nuts. And then like at the end, when she knocked the meat down, finally, she just kind of fell, like purposely chose to drop herself down the tree and just was fine and went after the meat. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> watching Benzie was my my favorite thing at the zoo that day. And they have red pandas. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Got a tie in that red panda there. <laughs> yeah, always, always. I'm legally required to. <laughs> it's in the contract yep. that you wrote for yourself. Yep, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> They're kind of the size of a red panda, but without the tail and all the fluffiness. Yes. And like 
just solid muscle. When I was down in Naples, I got to meet their honey badgers. Now, it was protected contact, but I got to be like right up at the fence. And one was very curious about me. And um, yeah, you definitely got the feeling that like this was an animal that could finish you. Even though it's, right, like, though? tiny, but, like, wow, they're just a- astonishingly cool, though. Yeah. Nice. So um, how many honey badgers did you work with, Emily? Um, I worked with four, and they have uh, six there, which we didn't actually go in with them either. We Their enclosures are divided into two sections, so we'd put them on one side and service the other side and then move them over. Uh, but it was really fun to as zookeepers uh, use our enrichment train brains and figure out different enrichment to give them and different ways to present their diet and like putting it up on the climbing structures and then them figuring out how to climb up because they can't jump. Uh, Different stuff like that. That's really cool. Do they, uh, does the facility there like count on having um, zookeepers come in and such to figure this out and to help build their program? So not necessarily zookeepers, but they definitely rely on volunteers. So uh, COVID hit them really hard. So not only is there an income from having the volunteer program, because volunteers stay on grounds and everything, um, but they they definitely have, have um, volunteers coming in, taking care of the animals. So they have, I think, three paid staff members. And then they have some long-term volunteers who are basically staff members just waiting for that like position to open up, um, more funding to come in. So then how does that work for y'all? How long were you there? And do you guys just not get paid? You're just, you know, were you able to use vacation time from Zoo Knoxville or is this just you lost money to do this? All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. So we are so lucky, again, to be part of Xenoxil's program with this because we got paid like we were at work. What? Um, so they paid for our trip to Africa and that also paid us to work in Africa. And we fully recognize that we are ridiculously lucky to have this grant and the funding, um, which is why like, I, it's just so amazing to me that our zoo does this for so many people. Um, but yeah, so we were there. Uh, but the other volunteers, they weren't. They were using their vacation time. They were using all the money that they had, they save up for years to be able to come and do this. And we're just there like, yeah, same. Like, fully paid for by work. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to pause right now and say that, you know, we talk about the fact that zoos are conservation organizations in a lot of ways, but this is such a cool way to actually send experienced keepers and off to do in situ conservation work. Zoo Knoxville gets all the praise and props for that. And I I hope that we see more zoos doing that kind of thing in the future. That is freaking amazing. And if you are a person who is a keeper who listens to these episodes, and I know there are a lot of you, hi, um, think about this when you're looking for places to work and think about the, these kinds of things, because that's amazing. And I just, that just makes my heart so happy. Yeah. It's, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, I think one of the best things that ours is doing, because I, I, as a person, feel like I'm making a difference for conservation. Not that I don't make a difference with my animals' lives that I work with every day. Like, obviously, I love them. I love taking care of them. But zookeeping is more than just taking care of your animals. Like, we are we don't have animals in zoos in the U.S. just for people to come in and laugh and be like, hey, that's so cool. It's so fun. If we did that, then we would just be like Tiger King. Like, we're just making money off it. The whole point of having the animals is to teach people about conservation, to teach people about those animals in the wild and the threats that they face and the things that we're doing to help protect them. So for us to go out to Africa and be able to go and help these organizations actually like boots on the ground, taking care of these species, um, it, it just changes the way you think of things. So coming back and talking to visitors, I can say, hey, this is what I saw. This is what we did. This is why you should support our zoo. Every ticket sold goes into this Um, There's a portion of it that goes into the fund that's helping us do this work. Um, So I always say thank you to visitors. And we're like, okay, you're weird. But but still, like, seriously, like, thank you to everybody that supports our zoo and other zoos 
especially AZA accredited zoos. That's why we can make a difference. And I think it's so, so important for us to be doing that and to recognize as keepers, we can be doing that and we should. We also, while we were there, um, to build off of Tiffany's point of like actually going and getting to see stuff and then being able to bring that to visitors. We didn't, our day to day was taking care of the runs like we talked about, but we also got to see a lot of the other work they do that can't necessarily involve volunteers. Like they have uh, permanent resident lions and cheetahs and other non-releasable animals. So we got to go see how they take care of them. And we, you know, we helped clean their enclosures and stuff, but we weren't shifting them or anything. But we also got to go out and see some releases back into the into the wild the wild in south africa is very fenced in which i think was a surprise to me the first time i went and i think was a surprise to tiffany um definitely yeah it's very different than kenya yeah these fenced in areas are massive reserves like when you're in the reserve you can't see the fence unless you're right up next to it but when you're driving along the road it's all fences uh but it's actually In some ways, it helps because these private reserves um, have money to patrol for poaching and in some ways have more resources in terms of that than like the national parks might. Um, So we got to go see some releases onto Maholoholo's reserve land. So we saw a kingfisher and some squirrels. Um, We also saw they work with local um, homeowners and landowners to help remove what people might see as pest animals. So they'll go, uh, people can call them, they'll set up traps and then relocate those animals. And it gives local people the alternative, an alternative to killing those animals. And they also educate uh, people who live nearby on how to live with these animals. And one big thing that I really liked was they bring in local school groups. While we were there, there were hundreds of school kids. And there's, as we were told multiple times, 11 official languages in South Africa. Wow. So they will hire local guides who are going through their, there's a certification that you need to do to be, become a, a wildlife guide or a wildlife ranger. And they'll pay for their courses. And while they're paying for their courses, those guides will do tours of the facility and of the permanent residents. And they'll purposefully hire people who speak the local language of like the school children and take them through with tours. Because a lot of these kids may not even have seen these animals that are native to their country. And that, you know, we as foreigners... Tiffany and I are super lucky in that we got our trip funded, but that people save for years to go see. So I thought it was really cool to see not only the work they do with the wildlife, but also what they're doing to build conservation in their own country. And then we can go back and talk about that and raise support for programs like that. That's all absolutely fascinating. And, you know, you mentioned watching uh, squirrels get released back into the wild. And I think that's hilarious. I don't think you think of like an African rehab releasing squirrels, um, but that's really cool that they do. And also, Tiffany, are you afraid of the squirrels as well or were you OK? OK, no, I'm not afraid of squirrels. Um, there, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but so when I was a child, <laughs> there was a chipmunk that I was terrified of. I told everybody it was a mean chipmunk. Um, my neighbor ended up having to come put a live trap to relocate it because I was I wouldn't go up the stairs because this mean chipmunk would look at me. So I guess maybe I am traumatized by them. Tiffany. I don't like things that can bite you. It just freaks me out to be Everything like. Everything can bite you. Yes. I know, but like chimps are protected contact. And yes, one may have broken my pinky. <laughs> it's fine. But like, you know what I mean? Like there's boundaries. So even working with goats, I think, is more intimidating than working with chimps. But then again, like just walking with wildlife in in the wild, it's different than in an enclosed setting where it's like I am in your space and there's not really room for me to walk away from you, for you to walk away from me. Like, I don't know. I'm way more comfortable doing like game walks, just like walking out in the bush where there could be a lion right over there than I would be like walking through a goat yard. 
how the hell did you become a zookeeper? But we've already uh, addressed that in previous episodes. Primates? Yeah, fair. All right. <laughs> so um, this is just amazing. I did not know this about you, and I'm so entertained. I'm weird. I, well, that I knew about you, but not for these reasons. <laughs> um, so, okay. So when you're in Africa, um, I feel like you just collect a bunch of cool stories. So instead of me asking and hoping to land on some of those, you mm-hmm. said you had some Steve Martin stories. I, I remember uh, seeing some posts on Facebook about some stuff. So tell me some of the crazy stuff that happened. I want to share my favorite, most random thing that happened to me as a keeper. So um, I have talked to everybody about Dolly and Polly Rhino, who are two of the oldest rhinos in the world. Um, Just to recap, spotlight on them because they're amazing. Um, (laughs) They are southern white rhinos. And um, their life expectancy is about 40 to 45. Our girls are 54, so they're ancient. Only five have ever lived above their 50s. We have two of them, right? Super cool. Our girls came from South Africa, which I knew before going there. Um, They came from a uh, park that's just south of Kruger. Um, I'm not even making this up. The guy, uh, Brian Jones, who's the head of Mahalo Hollow, who started it, literally relocated the rhinos that I work with to Zoo Knoxville. Whoa! We had no idea when applying to this. And I was like, hmm, like this this game reserve in Pelosi, like that sounds familiar. Let me, Project Rhino or Operation Rhino, what is that? So I looked it up and then I was like, wait a minute, this, there's two things lining up here. And then I asked him about it and he was like, oh yeah. So something that I think is so cool to tell people about now. um, So like, if I say our girls came from Africa, people are immediately like, why did you take them out of the wild? Why are they... Out of it. And what I thought the reason was, was it was a different world in the 70s, which is when our girls came uh, to our zoo. And the truth is that rhino populations were so threatened at that time. Uh, poaching was just crazy in the late 60s um, that they didn't have any rhinos in Kruger National Park. And they basically wanted to disperse the rhinos so that way they could have a backup, essentially. Um, so if they were all totally wiped out of South Africa, We'd still have some in zoos in the U.S. And that's actually why my girls were there. That's actually what saved northern white rhinos in Kenya is that those two that are the last two left on the planet, they were from a zoo in the Czech Republic. They were brought down. So it's kind of that insurance policy. Um, The sad part is rhino populations and poaching is really bad again in South Africa. So um, I didn't know how bad it was. And it was honestly depressing. (laughs) Um, But it's just interesting. You get that bigger, like, conservation picture and why zoos matter so much which obviously we know we work in a zoo but still it's it was just crazy and then when I was showing him pictures of Dolly and Polly I intentionally left out the pictures of them wearing like Santa hats um thought that might be weird um which is a good thing with this guy but he he I mean almost had tears in his eyes because each girl has had about 10 babies um so it's I mean they they've made a really big difference for rhino populations in zoos in the U.S. um and the greater population. So I just thought that was super random and super cool. Um, Brian Jones is just the coolest guy. That's so awesome. And I'm so weirded out every time you say his name because Brian Jones was one of the founding members of the Rolling Stones and he died in 1969. And I'm wondering if he just uh, ran away instead of actually dying and um, and and went to Africa and started. That'd be the place to go. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I like it. He also knows Steve Martin. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yeah. So, so you said you had Steve Martin stories. Tell me Steve Martin stories. And for those listening, this is the trainer guy, not the actor guy. <laughs> that's what you think. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that's basically the whole story is that he knows Steve Martin. Um, Steve Martin's helped train some of the birds there. Brian shared knowledge that he has with Steve. So it's kind of this cross communication thing. So, um, we were like the messenger. So we brought like this USB filled with videos of releases and Brian asked us to send it to Steve and we're like, Oh my gosh, we're so cool. Mailing this to Steve Martin. So it was, yeah, it's our fancy that's, celebrity story for you. That's really cool. No, that's awesome. And it's cool that you're able to facilitate that kind of thing. Like, Definitely. you know, it, it really, you never realize how you're going to connect with things. That was actually at the conference Uh, I was waiting to talk to Dan Ash, the president of the AZA, and there was one person talking to him first, but like it was my time. And then somebody walked up to him and just patted him on the shoulder and said, hey, Steve Martin's over there. And I looked where that guy said, and there was Steve Martin and he was alone. 
And I was like, well, while I'm waiting. So I went and talked to Steve, told him about the podcast, told him about like my connection with like Vouter Stillard and such, who has worked with him, you know, before and such. And um, then immediately pivoted and went back and talked to Dan Ash. And I was like, what is this conference? And then <laughs> I, I both before and after talking to them got really good ice cream. So, I mean, it's just an incredible experience all <laughs> Reinforce around. Reinforce it. <laughs> so, no, yeah. Steve's cool. He definitely no, cool. changed the way that I train um, after working with him. And it's cool because they're a huge sponsor for Mahalo Halo. So they're a big part of why they can do what they do. That's awesome. I, I love how interconnected this world is. Right. Um, yeah, it's just it's just astonishing. And it's it's just so cool. And we're all there for the animals. So, yeah, um, I'm curious, as y'all were talking about rhinos, I've been doing some research recently for Project Dragonfly classes. Hey. And I know you're excited. And <laughs> um, the uh, I've been looking into the whole uh, preemptively dehorning rhinos thing. For, for a thing I was just talking about in, in my class. And I'm curious if y'all had thoughts or if um, you heard anything about that while you were in Africa. I feel like I'm talking a lot, Emily. Do you want to take this one or do you want me to go? We didn't hear about it as like a strategy that they've used in South Africa. Um, I did talk to Brian about it a little bit. So with... Um, the rhino dehorning, there's really no point. So if you're tracking a rhino, um, like say you're a poacher, you're going out, you're looking for this rhino, you spend days tracking it. You're not just going to get there and be like, oh, it doesn't have a horn. I'm going to go get another rhino. You're going to be like, oh, well, this wasted my time. So then you kill it. And then you go and you find a rhino that might have a horn, which ties in really well to what Emily's about to tell you. So one of the other things that Mahola Holo does is um, they've been the only rehab so far that has been able to rescue vultures from mass poisonings. And the reason mass poisonings are such a big issue, especially this year, is because there have been so many rhinos poached that the vultures have learned that they can follow the rhinos. And then when there is a kill from poachers, the vultures will be flying in the sky. Um, above the kill, which then tells the rangers where there might be a poacher kill. So actually right before we went, they were saying, um, and this is happening like in Kruger National Park and the big well-known places like that. Um, Right before we went, they were saying there had been a mass poisoning where poachers had led a donkey into the park, um, partially because donkey prints look like zebra prints. So if anyone sees, you know, weird tracks, they don't look like weird tracks. And then they killed the donkey, put poison in its gut, and it killed a leopard, I think seven lions, and over 200 vultures were poisoned. So Maholaholo was able to rest. If they're called in time and get to the vultures in time, they were able to rescue 21 of them and bring them back through intensive medical care and release they release all of the ones that they can back into the wild. But mass poisoning for vultures was something that I didn't know anything about as a conservation issue. And if anyone listening is not a vulture fan, they should be. Yes, vultures are incredible. I honestly incredible. wasn't before this trip. I was like, oh, I mean, huh. cared about them like I care about dolphins. Just like, hey, cool <laughs> over there. But no, definitely huge vulture fan now. Wow, that is fascinating. I had I had not heard about that at all they just had another one maybe two weeks ago um which i think was again over 200 um if i remember correctly it's a lot they were able to rescue some from that but yeah it's always a massive amount it feels like you know i don't know but i feel like so often like with my work with red panda network and everything when we study the people that are poaching so often the story is just they're really poor people who really need the money to feed their families and such and so like the approach that you take in those moments is you try to you know give them money and educate them and and give them jobs and and suddenly they stop poaching it sounds like the poachers in africa are just kind of jerks it depends. So rhino poachers, just kind of jerks. You're in it for the money. Um, super, super depressing conservation messaging. Um, like uh, Brian's grandson um, was an, on an anti-poaching team with a really cute dog. Um, <laughs> but they were telling us they had tracked poachers, rhino poachers, found 
basically the most incriminating things possible, like the guns, the horns, blah, 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 all the things, right? They catch these rhino poachers and like a couple days later, they're released because it's just the corruption goes so high. And they're like, why did we spend all this time catching these poachers if you're not going to do anything about it? So it's just, it's really frustrating because it's all about the money. Um, I think we were told um, I don't, a, a lot, basically, there's a lot of uh, corruption with the Rangers at Kruger, not necessarily being like, hey, there's a rhino immediately right here, come shoot it. But being like yesterday, there was a rhino in this area, and then you can get money to support your family for a year and that. But the people actually making all this money from the rhino horn, which again is keratin, so the same thing as our fingernail and our hair, um, they're just like, it's just so messed up. It's frustrating because it's not to feed your family. Yeah, that's really disappointing and depressing. And I, I yes. think it's something that I think more people need to be aware of. Because like I said, I have this kind of attitude. Granted, I'm I'm looking, you know, my main focus is on the Red Panda stuff. And, and that's a very different what? story. But um, I, I definitely would have thought that it was it, it was financial, but in a more desperation need than a get rich need. And it's, it's good to know that and be aware of that. Um, on a side note, going back to the whole horn thing, I find it interesting that they don't think it's working. Uh, the people that you were talking to, I literally just read a study that was done in a different park yesterday. Um, not that the study was done yesterday, but my reading of it, but that um, over 50 percent reduction in rhino poaching in that park uh, once they started dehorning. So, I mean, it's a new thing. I'm not surprised that there are different data points and data sets and and there are other factors that can't be looked at um but i i i found your answer very interesting given that i just wrote and and was citing this paper <laughs> about that yeah right but that's that's honestly i mean that's that's the hard part of conservation in the wild i think is that like sometimes you just don't know how how do you really know what's happening in this vast wild i think it's really important to keep in mind too that um Obviously, we all know Africa is a big place, um, and the the situation with even rhino conservation in South Africa is, or rhino poaching or whatever, is different to Kenya. Totally different. Totally different story. So Tiffany mentioned um, the consequences for the poachers in South Africa are not nearly enough to reduce any of the poaching. Like if they get arrested, they may not they if they even get convicted or they it doesn't even go to trial because they post bail because the big organized crime that poaching falls under has the money to post bail and then the poachers just leave and they if they don't come back to there then they don't get um uh charged but tiffany's been to kenya and it's shoot to kill mm -hmm. shoot on site shoot to kill wow yeah they don't mess around. But Opechita hasn't had poaching in years, rhino poaching. And yes, this is one big, like, fenced-in place. It's 90,000 acres. But, I mean, people aren't even – I'm sure they're trying to get in, but it's it's such a different conservation picture. Um, the community involvement, people are proud of the rhinos. Uh, South Africa, honestly, it just was kind of soul-crushing. Super interesting, super great. And I will say this as, like, blank statement. Brian Jones is definitely an old-school conservation mindset um which isn't the uh he said bunny hugger a lot but like like i want this like happy <laughs> fun like you can make a difference by what you're doing motivate you and brian's like now we're all doomed i was like oh my god um but then um the acting manager i think he's technically the assistant director marshall um Emily was smart and asked him his conservation story because i was like traumatized by brian <laughs> i was like oh my god i want to hear anymore um, but do you want to say what he said? It was um, so I asked Marshall, and he he had a definitely a more hopeful message than Brian. Um, but in a nutshell, what he said was like, "We know the door's closing. Like, we know obviously the world's going to end. Um, animals are going to go extinct. But what can we do now to prolong that end? What can we do now to keep animals?" from going, you know, prolong how long we have animals, how long we can serve them. Um, like, yes, there's an end, but what, yeah, what can we do now? And it does make a difference what we do now, even if it's within the local community and for the local wildlife. Absolutely. And I just, I, I actually just read this paper uh, for, for class again. Um, and I, I, 
I'm not going to lie. I struggled with it and I question mm-hmm. some of the methodology and, and some of the messaging. But uh, it, it's it's called From Bottleneck to Breakthrough. Oh, yes. Yes. OK. OK. I and that one. yeah. And so basically the authors explain that, um, you know, a lot of the things that are affecting conservation negatively right now, like the growth of the, the world population and stuff are, are kind of expected to just stop on their own, not because of conservation work, not because of, um, you know, anything to do with like saving animals, but just there are factors in play that when you look at them, it makes sense that, you know, this will eventually top off and that more humans will naturally move to urban areas uh, actually leaving there more space in the, the wild again and such and um there's this kind of hope that these authors have um that if those things happen conservation will become easier because we will get through the bottleneck we're currently in and then we can actually start to change our strategies to to help grow the populations that we have saved so the work we're doing now is wildly important because there are reasons to believe that external factors are going to make what we're doing matter more outside of you know our own work and i think that is awesome even though again i also question some of the the way it was written but uh you know that's besides the point (laughs) I'll take hope where I, I can get it. I love that about Project Dragonfly, though, because I feel like you really read a lot and you really think about the different articles. Like, I was in that class years ago now. I started in 2019, and I still remember that exact paper. And I remember my thought process on it was like, all right, but what about all the species before we get there? Yes, yeah, that <laughs> so too, like, yeah. What are we going to lose before we get there? And I think that ties into what Marshall was saying, like, how how can we slow this down, basically, <laughs> like the loss of species in order to get to the point where maybe we can make a difference or maybe humans will die out. Who knows? But yeah, which, how many species still will we be, take with us? That would still be making a difference for Definitely. the best in, in the, the world's view, probably. But, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> Sorry, but that's Janet. that's awesome. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I wasn't even going to talk about this on the pod. But since we got here, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm two weeks into Project Dragonfly. And I've been fairly underwhelmed uh, in my experience. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not going to be great. Uh, I can't wait. I'm going to the zoo uh, to meet up with people, you know, this weekend for in-person classes. And that that I think will help. But it blows my mind that the first interview that I'm doing since starting, I'm now quoting two different assignments <laughs> uh, and and get, maybe I really am en- it enjoying it and learning. Yeah, that uh, seems to be what's happening. I'm feeling better about it now than yeah. I had been up till this point because here we are discussing it. So my sister um, is a physicist uh, for the government. So like smarty pants, whatever. Um, So she was going through her grad school program at the same time I was. And naturally, she'd make fun of me all the time. Um, They call it like kindergarten masters. So like, I mean, it's not ridiculously hard. And I'll say that. Um, I think it's pretty easy to get an A in Project Dragonfly. But for me, the difference is um, it's what you're getting out of it. So like, I am such a better conservationist because of what I learned in Project Dragonfly. Um, And like you just you make so many connections and you learn so many things and you have so many different perspectives. You're like, oh, yeah, I never thought of it that way. Um, And then I can be like, oh, yeah, I totally disagree with you. But now I know why, because I know both sides. Um, So I feel like I gosh, I just love Project Dragonfly. And I do think um, part of you not immediately loving it is because they switch things up this year and are letting people start in the fall before you started in like. I don't know, like March, April. And then you were prepping for your trip in the summer. So you're doing, for me, it was Belize. So like I was doing all my research on Belize, learning about Belize. And then I went on this trip. So it's like, you kind of start running <laughs> basically. Um, there's like throw you into it. And yeah. So you're getting the more like the bigger picture side before you're fully invested. Like this right. is the best thing ever. You'll get there. I, mean, I, I guarantee you'll get there. I, I believe it. Everyone that I know, I mean, you're not the only person who sold me on this idea. What? Everyone basically that I know that <laughs> yeah. did it loves it. Project um, Dragonfly spokesperson. Yeah, seriously. You definitely have them all. <laughs> there, I think there have also just been a lot of, I'm, I'm very much like, just do things right. And not in the classes, but like outside of that, there have been all kinds of errors and stuff that I've gotten from the school and just like emails that shouldn't have been sent. And like this text program that I went to opt out of and they, they sent it to me and were like, if you opt out, do this. And I did. And they were like, your number's not in this program. And I was like, thank you. You just texted me. Like what is happening? So some of that stuff, but now that I'm actually using the conservation knowledge already for this interview, I'm already like, all right, this is, this is a little better. Yes. But we yes. are not here to talk about me being in school. We're here to talk <laughs> right. about y'all being in Africa. So um, were there any other things you wanted to touch on? I think for me, um, not just, it was really cool learning about all the conservation stuff and being there in person to see it. But I also took back 
some stuff that's applicable to my day to day in terms of being keeper. Um, so like I said, my main interest was in the vape hoof stock, uh, cause I'm a hoof stock girl. So right before we got there, they had been raising a baby rhino and a baby zebra. And right before we got there, they had sent the baby rhino to a rhino orphanage to be with another rhino. And then they sent the baby zebra to be with at to a different rehab to be with a similarly aged baby zebra because they do need to learn how to be with their own species. But this was after they were a few months old. They had gotten them stabilized. Um, and talking to them about how they raise these babies was really interesting because, and it makes sense when you think about it, they base everything on how their herd structure is in the wild and how mom raises them in the wild. So for baby antelope and gazelles in the wild, mom will tuck them away in like a bush or something during the day, kind of like our white-tailed deer here, and will return every so often to feed them. And babies need to eat every two hours which is great when you're trying to sleep and do it 24 seven. But <laughs> yeah. Um, in order to raise those babies, they would go do what's necessary to feed them and get them to defecate and everything and then leave. But baby rhinos and baby zebra are with the herd 24 seven. So they actually had volunteers with those babies 24 seven. They slept with them. They, you know, fed them. Um, they interacted with them. Each one of them also had some health issues that they needed constant supervision for. Uh, but just that small factor of, of course, we as zookeepers try to give our animals the most natural lives possible. Um, but thinking about it in like a different perspective while also basing it on how their wild counterparts live um, was something that really struck me. Their staff's incredible too. Um, they're our age or younger. I mean, it's three three people, right? Um, full time, yeah. But they they know so much, and they're so good at what they do. And it's just, it was amazing to learn from them and still keep in touch with them. Um, it was just, it was mind blowing because I was like, you know your stuff. I wasn't gonna swear on a podcast. What they've been able to do with these animals, like they figured out that this baby rhino is lactose intolerant. And she's drinking milk. Um, so they figured out uh, an appropriate substitute so that she could still get all of her vitamins and nutrients. And it's like when like when baby Fiona was premature. Like, who's raised a premature hippo? You know, who's dealt with a, a lactose intolerant baby rhino? And they do collaborate with other um, rescues and stuff in South Africa, but a lot of those rescues actually look to Maholoholo for recommendations on what to do with animals that they get in. So. That's so cool. It was definitely cool to see the interactions with the um, the different organizations. So Emily mentioned before, Maholoholo doesn't hold on to primates that come in um, because they're not set up for it, but they do send them to Possum Member Sanctuary, uh, Vervet Forest. So Emily and I, uh, because obviously I'm a primate person, I have to go to the, prim- the Possum places there. Uh, we went up, we delivered a microscope and then got a tour of Vervet Forest. And it is so cool. <laughs> but when they get in um, like an antelope or a vulture or something, they send it to Mahalo Hollow. So it's like that nice cross of like, hey, you know your stuff. I'm going to send you this. Like, let's swap. And let's take care of these animals together. So it was cool. That's awesome. How did you guys decide to go to this particular project? Emily found it. How did you find it? So I was looking for... Um volunteer opportunities and I've been since I've been to South Africa before I had a little bit more reference to um places to go and there's there's not very reputable places there's some not very reputable places in not just South Africa I think across Africa that um claim that they're conservation organizations but like for example there's places that have quote unquote orphan baby lions that volunteers come and feed and think that they're helping to raise, but then these lions go into the canned hunting um, industry or whatever. So I wanted to make sure that the place we wanted to go was reputable. Um, 
And I actually uh, asked around other zookeepers. Um, when I went five years ago, we volunteered with a vervet monkey sanctuary called Mangalela. And I asked the coworker who had referred me to them um, for other places to go. And Mahola Hola was spoken of very highly by other keepers and other keepers who had volunteered there. And I had heard them mentioned when I visited uh, before. So, and then we just, I looked more into it and shared it with Tiffany and got all that info. So. Awesome. Very cool. Um, are, are there any like, you know, other organizations that you want to talk about or anything like that? Anyone you want to give a plug to or tell people how they can find Mahalo Halo or any of that so, such? Yes, I have it written down. Oh, um, so we also got to go to Chimp Eden, um, which is a Jane Goodall chimp sanctuary. Obviously, there's no I guess obvious um, there's no chimps that live in South Africa, just in the wild. Um, but these guys all came down from different sanctuaries, um, like just different issues that they had super amazing i was like blown away definitely fangirling like this is the best place ever because i've known about them like my whole life just been so excited to go there so champ eden's awesome if you're in south africa go visit it's great um mahalo hollow their instagram um they're on facebook as well but it's mahalo hollow underscore wildlife underscore rehab how do you spell mahalo hollow I wrote this down for this exact question. Love you. Um, M-O-H-O-L-O-H-O-L-O. So many hoes. see, there's a lot of hoes. Yeah, so many (laughs) hoes. And then it's underscore wildlife underscore rehab. I'm guessing you can spell those ones. I can. I I question (laughs) with some of my listeners, but I won't say who. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy. Um, And then Bombalela that Emily mentioned, we also got to go there for a few days. Um, And the owner, I guess, Silka, She is so nice. She let us stay at her house and she knew Emily. Um, And we like hung out with her dog. She had uh, Rottweiler's Great Danes. And I was like, this is the best ever. Like surrounded by dogs the whole time. It was great. Um, We definitely had bruises from like playing with these massive dogs. (laughs) So (laughs) just so I'm clear, just so I'm clear on this, you went to Africa to hang out with dogs Yep. work with bunnies and chickens that you're afraid of and True. did you even go to africa or did they just like no. take you down the street and there. and tell you oh we're in africa now <laughs> sure yeah here, here okay. are some bunnies here are some dogs yeah <laughs> no silk is also german um so she's from the same like area where i was a foreign exchange student for a ah. year after high school i did not speak german with her though because honestly i forgot most of it and i was like oh gosh you know my weird dialect that i speak i'm not speaking it to you no uh um Anyway, so Silk was great. And then we went over to Bombalela and it was really, really cool to see their vervet release. Um, so as a primate person, um, I, I'm i all about the primate. So like sanctuaries, you do the best you can. So vervet forests, they don't do a lot of releasing, if any. Um, so they keep them there in these incredible habitats. And it's it's absolutely wonderful there. But Bombalela is different because they're not set up to keep them forever. They have some that are permanent residents, um, but they... They have these different stages that they go through before they release these whole troops. So they work with different um, community members and areas, and then they'll go and release the troop there. They'll monitor them. Emily knows more about all this. But the important thing is their social media. (laughs) Um, It is Bombalela Monkey. So B-A-M-B-E-L-E-L-A. Say that again. B-A-M-B-E-L-E-L-A. Monkey. Um, so you can find them on Facebook and Instagram and they are doing a fundraiser right now, um, that I helped set up, which is cool. Um, so it's, uh, basically helping them raise fuel. So I was talking to them about, um, different things that PASA member sanctuaries have done to raise, raise funds. And if you say, Hey, can you help us support this one thing? Can you buy grapes for this chimpanzee? Can you buy fuel so we can get food? Um, people are more likely to donate. So they're doing that right now. If anyone wants to donate. Awesome. And uh, (laughs) then I guess, uh, uh, Emily, did you have anything else? Um, I would like to also mention for Bombalela, they just released their 27th Vervet Monkey Troop. Yay! um, Which is incredible. Um, They take these, they take in all ages of monkey. They've taken orphans. They take in, you know, older ones that have been injured. um, But they're able to take these monkeys, unless they need to be um, permanent residents, like they do have a, a handicap 
troop for monkeys that um, some have seizures, some are blind, some are missing some limbs and have some mobility issues, but the rest of them, they take through this whole process and it takes, I think, four to five years, to, but they make sure that the troop is fully bonded um, and obviously able to survive in the wild. And then they find local landowners and you can only release one troop per kind of territory area. So they have to go pretty far sometimes to find release sites. Um, so the fact that they've done 27 successful releases is amazing. But yeah, they could definitely use donations. And- awesome. Awesome. Yeah. One of my uh, best friends is obsessed with vervets. So uh, That's um, a place and, to go. It's cool. And not like an animal person. He is a guitarist and actor. And uh, one day he was like, I love vervet monkeys. And I was like, it's like, yeah. I mean, one thing that's cool about Bumbalela is you don't need to be an animal person. A lot of their volunteers aren't. So they have these like really nice cottages you can stay in and then go and do whatever level of volunteering you want. Um, but it's, it was cool. I would go there. Um, that's awesome. If I didn't know anything about animals, wanted to volunteer. It's a good place to start. Very cool. <laughs> Plus all right. Primates. Well, yes, primates, obviously. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, all right. So let's do it. It's time. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Rossifari poop story. Hit me. Yes. Do you have one, Emily? Oh, I have two. We all know I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one first. Um, so <laughs> something that I do on every trip that I take, no matter where I'm going, like I like to just remind myself, like, I'm in Africa right now. Like, I'm doing this. This is so cool. Um, so we were getting enrichment for our animals, the servals that I was working with. I had two of them. Um, so I was out collecting diker poop. And what I always say to myself is, how often do I get to do this? Like, I'm picking up diker poop right now. And then I was like, wait, I work with a diker. <laughs> I literally do it all the time. But it was just kind of funny because I was just like, this is so cool. And I was like, wait a minute. This this is not that abnormal for me. But it was cool because the servals liked it. But how often do I pick up diker poop in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> it's my my decker one emily you have one um i thought of one so i have worked with carnivores and primates before but i typically work with hoofstock and they eat leaves and grass so their poop doesn't smell nearly as much as carnivores and primates um and the honey badgers like to bury their poop sometimes oh and it's it's small like you know they're not very big animals but finding their poop was fairly easy because you could smell it. <laughs> so I spent a fair amount of time walking around corners just sniffing. Sniffing, sniffing and maybe <laughs> digging to for find poop. all their poop. Nice. That's fun. That's amazing. That's awesome. So my other poop story, poop story. is more of an oh, can I swear on here? Hell yes. An oh shit story. Um, so, so Emily and I were split up doing different tasks and I was out, um, with a team we're walking on like the perimeter of the, um, sanctuary at Mahalo Hollow. And we just came up on a ton of hippo poop. We were not by water. So I was like, where the fuck there's hippo walking here. <laughs> like what the heck? Cause that was one animal that I never saw in Kenya. I, I still haven't seen one in Kenya. Um, so I was just like, is the hippo going to pop out of like the forest? <laughs> what is going on here? But I guess at night the hippos come up, they graze and they go back to their water. But that's why hippos are the most dangerous um, animal in Africa is because if you get in between them and the water when they're walking, that's when you're in trouble. So if we had walked out and there was a hippo there and I was in between that and its water source, like, nice knowing you. <laughs> Death by chickens, rabbits, or hippo. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you both for doing this. It has been a blast as always. Yes, we love talking to you, especially now that you're in Project Dragonfly. Oh, how awesome was that episode? I love those girls so much. What wonderful humans. And how cool to think about the idea of zookeepers going out and doing in situ conservation. And I know, I know, I gave them all kind of praise in the episode, but I got to do it again. Zoo Knoxville, y'all rock hard. The fact that you allow this, and not just for keepers, but for 
anyone on your staff. I am officially blown away. Love y'all so much at that zoo. Um, yeah, so if you want to check them out, it's at Zoo Knoxville on social medias or zooknoxville.org. And uh, you you definitely should go do that and and find a way to go and visit and support people like Emily and Tiffany being awesome and going and doing the thing. So like I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, there is Patreon bonus content for my patrons. So um, you can go and become a patron, little as $3 a month, patreon.com slash Rossafari to hear that and a bunch of other bonus content from previous episodes. It's all on there once you sign up. Uh, and if you go ahead and join at the upper tier, the red panda level, then I'll say your name at the end of the episode. It'll sound something like this. Thank you to my Red Panda level patron, Lara Shank. See, that's how that works. It's pretty exciting. So yeah, go check it out, patreon.com slash Ross Safari. And uh, remember, friends, the word credits backwards is, in fact, Stiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley-Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.